what I found in my own experience is that on many occasions, it's the women who actually take their husbands to see the doctor to be valued for prostate cancer, especially West Indian men, you know, certain, and then they, they're told they're going to get the rectal exam, and, you know, they do all the So, um, okay, so, uh, it's a brief overview of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a malignant tumor that begins in the prostate. It might start in the prostate, but when it's advanced, it spreads. But it starts in the prostate. Next slide. And, uh, what is a prostate? Well, all the men have prostates. It's a gland of the male reproductive system. Uh, the purpose is to produce fluid that sperm basically swimming. So when, you know, when, 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 when men produce semen, the fluid that you see, most of it comes from the prostate. You can't see the sperm, it's microscopic, but you see the fluid. You know, men will say, oh, I have a lot of sperm. You don't know unless you look on a microscope to see sperm. The fluid is a semen. Um, it's about the size of a chestnut. It's small, and it's located in front of the rectum. That is why we can palpate it or feel it by doing a rectal exam. It's below the bladder, below the opening of the bladder. That is why when you have a large prostate, it squeezes the opening closed, and it's hard to urinate, and you have urinary symptoms. And, uh, and it wraps around the urethra. The urethra is a tube that takes urine from the bladder to the outside. And this is a picture of it. This is the bladder. This is the rectum. So you can do a rectal exam, finger inserted in the rectum, you can feel the prostate, bladder. This is the urethra. And this is this little thing here is a sphincter. And that is what holds our urine in, where we will leak on ourselves. And you see that's important uh, in men who have prostate cancer and who want to have prostate cancer surgery because one of the side effects of the surgery is urinary incontinence. Uh, because the sphincter can get damaged uh, during the operation. Next, please. So what is cancer in general? Cancer in general is an uncontrolled growth and potential spread of abnormal cells. Cells grow abnormally and become a mass, a tumor. Now, tumors can be uh, benign as an enlarged prostate. It's a tumor, but it's a benign tumor. You're not going to die from it. It makes you uncomfortable. You can't urinate well. You know, you get, you get up at night, but you're not going to die from uh, benign prostate enlargement. You know, you hear some men say they have swollen prostate. It's really an enlargement of a prostate. What we're worried about is really the malignant tumor that can form in the prostate. The word malignant is synonymous to cancer. Same thing. Uh, the reason why malignant tumors can kill is they invade structures, surrounding structures, and they break off into the bloodstream and into the lymphatic stream, spread into the brain, the bones, and the cancers in general. And that's how they kill people, they spread. The so cells break away from cancerous tumors, spread throughout the bloodstream, we call that metastasis. And that's usually the late stage of the disease. So, we see a malignant prostate that begins at the prostate gland. That's prostate cancer. It's the most common type of cancer diagnosed in American men. And there are over 20,000 new cases annually. Next. Now, all cancers need fuel to grow and progress. And prostate cancer depends on testosterone. That's a male hormone, from most of it is made in the testicle. A small amount is made in the adrenal gland. And this is what feeds prostate cancer to make it grow and to spread and cause problems. You know, uh, a man who doesn't have testicles will not get prostate cancer. Uh, you know, say a male at birth who lost the testicles because of the infarction of the testicle, the testicles weren't ascended, or uh, men who were born with genetic um, abnormalities, you know, they, they won't get prostate cancer. So you need testosterone, 
uh, for prostate to grow and spread. Next, please. Now, 65% of all prostate cancers are diagnosed in men over the age of 65 years old. If one does autopsies on all men and they die at the age of, say, 90 or above from other conditions, say, heart, you know, just old age, almost 100% of them will have some prostate cancer within the prostate. So, it, it, so men are probably destined to have prostate cancer. But those prostate cancers are the ones that we worry about. Those are just there doing nothing. The ones we worry about are the ones in younger men that are aggressive and can kill. Um, as we do know now, there is no way to differentiate the ones that are just there, not and causing the problems, and the ones that are aggressive. We know it's more aggressive in, in African men, uh, in black men, uh, Jamaicans in particular. And, um, but we don't have any good way of distinguishing which ones are going to be, 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 be deadly and which ones are just there, just hanging out. Um, we know that men who have first-degree relatives with prostate cancer are at a higher risk than men who don't have first-degree relatives uh, having prostate cancer. In fact, it ranges from 2 to 11 times more. If, you have a, if your father has prostate cancer or you have a brother who has prostate cancer, you are twice as much to 11 times as much um, uh, at risk of developing prostate cancer yourself. Uh, there's a link between breast cancer in women and prostate cancer. So if your mother has breast cancer, your sister has breast, breast cancer, there's a genetic link that you might be prone to getting prostate cancer as a man. Um, the, the, the death rate of prostate cancer is much higher in blacks than in whites. Uh, early screening of prostate cancer is recommended for, for, for black men. Jamaica men are the highest in the world. In terms of screening, if one is at risk, high risk of having prostate cancer, we think they should be screened earlier, meaning you get a PSA, you get a, a digital rectal exam, early age. In general, for black men, we say get screened at 45 years old. If you have a family history or any high risk of having the disease, we say get screened at 40. For white men, generally get screened at 50. If you have a risk, you say get screened at 45. So we drop the age down by five years if there's a, a, a family history or any other risk factor. Next, please. And uh, what causes prostate cancer? All cancers are caused by derangement in the genetic you know, material of the cells. In other words, all cell, any cell can become a cancerous cell if the, the DNA of the cell becomes damaged. Now we don't know what, cause, what damages the cells uh, in the prostate to cause prostate cancer. You know, we know that, for example, lung cancer, certain carcinogens, the things that cause cancer uh, in the lung, they, they, they stimulate the cells, they change the DNA of the cells, and cause the cells to become cancerous. We don't know what causes prostate cancer. We were looking at a lot of things, um, some people are saying too much exposure to sunlight, but then, you know, Norwegians have a high incidence of prostate cancer, second only to Jamaicans. Then they were saying acne. They were saying, that, you know, we don't know exactly what causes prostate cancer, but the, the, the research is ongoing. Um, you know, like I said, family history, race being black, age, most cancers we diagnose are over 65 years old. The, 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 the more advanced you get in age, the more likely you, you are to, to get prostate cancer. But not necessarily the more likely you are to get cancer that is dangerous for you. So most, a lot of times we diagnose prostate cancer, we say just leave it alone, don't do anything. You know, you're 80 years old, you know, it's not gonna kill you, you know? So, and it's slow growing anyway. And of course, genetics. Now, what are the symptoms of prostate cancer? Early prostate cancer does not have any symptoms. As the cancer grows, because of its location at the mouth of the bladder, you can start getting symptoms that are similar to the symptoms you get uh, with an enlarged prostate. Um, you get up at nights to urinate. Uh, uh, 
lunar frequency in the daytime. Uh, difficulty starting or maintaining a stream, a urinary stream, slowing all the stream, you know, straining to urinate. You can get blood in the urine. Um, those are the symptoms related to the, the, the mechanical obstruction of the, 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 the cancer growing uh, and, and, and obstructing the, the urine flow. Uh, of course, later in the disease when it spread, get, uh, prostate cancer uh, as a tendency to spread to bones. And, this, uh, and then it is when you get the bone pain, the back pain, the pain in the thigh bones and that kind of thing. But so, you know, the prostate cancer doesn't have uh, symptoms, asymptomatic. Next, please. Now, how do we assess for prostate cancer? Like I said before, men age 50 years and older and those uh, over age 45 were at risk of cancer. This is for the white population. The black population will drop these, these numbers by five years. Um, and, and, and the, the evaluation is pretty simple. Um, a PSA, which is a blood test, uh, and PSA means prostate specific antigen, and that's a, a substance made by the prostate. Usually the prostate, uh, it, it, it leaches into the blood in small amounts. And when, they, when there's some disturbance in the prostate, then the, the value, you know, goes up. Um, digital rectal exam, simple exam, takes five seconds. You know, the, 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 the physician uses a glove to finger it, lubricate it, and, and feels the prostate. And he can feel what he's feeling for, the size of the prostate, uh, and the texture of the prostate, and the symmetry of the prostate, whether one side is bigger than the other. These are things that can indicate whether or not there's a problem with the prostate. So again, PSA, abbreviation for prostate specific antigen. It's made by the prostate. Uh, the PSA test measures the levels in the bloodstream. So it's a simple blood test. We usually like to say four. You know, zero to four as being normal. Um, but we sort of tweak it a little bit. You know, if you're 35 years, if you're 45 years old, we like to say zero to 3.5. If you're 75 years old, we say, you know, 0 to 5.5. But 0 to 4, the general, 4 is a general. General that's accepted as high norm. And one has to bear in mind that up to 25% of men with prostate cancer will have a normal PSA. That is why you can't just go by the PSA alone. You have to do the PSA and the digital rectal exam. So, you know, 25% of men will have a normal PSA but when you do a rectal exam, you feel a lump, hard lump in the prostate. And that um, prompts the physician to recommend a, a biopsy of the prostate. Now, high PSA does not have to be prostate cancer. There are other reasons for the PSA to be, that, that can cause an elevation in the PSA. Just an enlarged prostate making a lot of PSA without any cancer. Benign prostate enlarged making a lot, of, a lot of PSA. That can cause an elevated PSA. Prostate cancer, of course, a prostate infection can cause a, a, a PSA. And this one is very important because you have more men with prostate infection than you have with prostate cancer. You know? And um, a lot of times we see patients come in, they'll have a PSA say in January, uh, PSA is 2, and then some doctor uh, does a PSA at the end of January, and the PSA is now 20, and the men get, al get alarmed, which yeah, for obvious reasons. But that's a good sign, because PSA produced by prostate cancer doesn't rise that fast. It's a slow rise. Fast rise usually um, from something else going on, some benign condition, um, prostate infection, and usually we give an antibiotic and recheck the PSA. And most, in most instances, it goes right back down to normal. Or if a patient has an enlarged prostate and, um, and goes into urinary retention, can't urinate, and someone puts a catheter in the bladder, you know, then that pushes the PSA up. Um, if the PSA is performed close to having sexual intercourse, that could make the PSA go up to um, prostate massage. 
you know, you go to the doctor, he feeds the prostate, but then the patient may have complained of some pelvic pain and the doctor massages the prostate, because we do that sometimes, and pushes on the prostate. That can cause pain to go up. Now, a patient has an abnormal PSA, or, uh, or an abnormal digital rectal exam, or both abnormalities, then the patient needs to find out is this cancer or not. And to make that diagnosis of prostate cancer, you have to have tissue for the pathologist to look at. You can't, anything else is just assumption. And we do that by doing what's called a biopsy. And a biopsy simply means taking samples of, of anything in a biopsy. You know, it's taking samples. No, it's not taking out the entire thing. It's just taking tiny needle samples. So you could take samples, you try to do representative samples to spread them out so you'd hit the cancer if it's there. But if you have only a small amount of cancer in a small spot, you could, you know, miss that too. So a yeah, negative biopsy does not necessarily mean the patient doesn't have cancer. So we try to do a representative sample. Nowadays we try to do 10 pieces, 10 small needle cores. It's done without anesthesia, unless the patient would have had many biopsies in the office that were negative, and then you say, you know, let's take him to the operating room and take 100 samples, then you need to get some anesthesia. But a normal 12 core biopsy can be done in the office without anesthesia. It's a little uncomfortable, you feel, you hear a popping sound, you feel a, a, a little bee sting each time the needle bites, and each sample is just, uh, no big, a little bigger than a pinhead. Um, and we send that to the lab, and then the pathologist will uh, look at it under the microscope and let us know. So, the needle used to remove small samples. It's blown through the rectum because the prostate is right there. You can do it by blind digital palpation, just feel with the finger, but nowadays we do um, ultrasound guidance. Of course, if there was an abnormal nodule palpated on digital rectal exam, we'll do extra pieces with the finger just guiding you right into that spot so you know you get in that spot. Um, so it's usually 12 pieces. It's examined under the microscope by the pathologist. Um, if, the, if cancer is found on biopsy, then the pathologist has to let us know how aggressive it is. And they, they usually, the pathologist will give it a grade. And the grade, the grade is referred to as a Gleason grade. The Gleason grade ranges from one to five. Where one is the least aggressive, five is the most aggressive. Now, in addition to a Gleason's grade, there's a Gleason score. And um, the Gleason score is a sum of two Gleason's grade. The pathologist looks at the tissue. The, the, the grade that is most dominant is given one number. The grade that is second most dominant is given another number. And both numbers can go from one to five. So you see, the score is a sum of these two numbers. So the score can go anywhere from two to 10. Maximum. One to five, two to four. And now, uh, yeah. So this is how the biopsy is performed. This is a transrectal probe going into the rectum. There's a small needle here. This is a prostate. And we take 12 pieces of the prostate. After the, after the biopsy, uh, most men will have some blood in the urine that hangs around for maybe a two or three days, drink a lot of water, it goes away. We may have some blood in the stool, that goes away. But, the, 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 the seminal vesicles are right here. These are the, the organs that store sperm. The prostate makes a fluid. After biopsy, you can see blood in the semen for up to a month or two. It's not a problem, and it usually goes away. But uh, um, one of the, 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 the main side effects of prostate biopsy that we worry about most is, is getting an infection, because you go through the rectum, you know, you can get an infection, you can get an infection that spreads to the bloodstream. It seems it's not bad. I've not had one in, 
maybe about 18 years, but what we have noticed nowadays throughout the entire world, there's an increase in the, in the incidence of um, prostate biopsy uh, uh, related infections. Now, the we usually give an antibiotic starting the day before, uh, you take it the day of, and then you complete it the day after. And, what, and this antibiotic has been reliable for the last uh, 18 years, but what we have noticed now, throughout the world, there has been an increase in the incidence of prostate biopsy infections. For some reason, the, 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 the germ that causes <coughs> prostate biopsy infections uh, is now more and more be, being found to be resistant to this particular antibiotics. So in many instances, we take the patients to the hospital and do the biopsy and give, and give them some IV antibiotics before. So, but we still do it in the office uh, on most occasions uh, and, 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 and counsel the patient to be aware that if they get an infection, if he gets an infection, he has to let us know right away. Next, please. So this is a, a cartoon of the grading system. Grade one, recent grade one. Most of the cells look almost like normal cells, you know, very close to normal. And as you go down, they start looking less and less like normal prostate tissue. And you know, it gets more aggressive as you go down, right? This is not one, this could be one biopsy specimen, but Usually, in a biopsy specimen, you might see a population of this and then a population of something else. And then you had, if, if you see this as the most dominant feature of the biopsy, then, and then this as the second most feature, then you'll have three plus one, the greedy score of four, and so on and so forth. That's how we get the come, come up with the score. And this is important because the score will tell you, it gives an idea of the prognosis and it helps us to direct treatment of, of the prostate cancer. If you have a lot of just grade one and you're 70 years old, you say, well, then just watch it, don't do anything. No, that's fine. But then if you're grade three and you're 70 years old, then you might want to do something. No? So it, it helps. And these are just a possible um, scores. We add the two grades on these. You know, we say when, when the sum comes up to two to four, we say it's well differentiated, meaning the, the overall prognosis is very good. When the score goes from, you know, the total score is between five and six, then we say the, the prognosis gets worse. Eight to ten is poor, poorly differentiated and very aggressive. Next, please. Now, grade and stage are two different things. Grade is how the prostate appears to the pathologist under the microscope, and then he gives it a score. The stage is how far the cancer has spread, how extensive the disease is. You don't need a microscope for that. What you need are bone scans, CT scans, to determine if cancer has spread to the lymph nodes, we're, we're the, 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 the most predominant landing sites for prostate cancer to spread to are the lymph nodes, especially the pelvis, and the bones. Those are the two first areas they go to. So we normally do a CAT scan or a normal, uh, and, and a bone scan. You can also have extensive disease locally where it invades the neck of the bladder, the seminal vesicles. It hardly never goes into the rectum, but I've never seen that. But, you know, being so close to the prostate, that's a possibility. So you can have extensive local regional disease, or you can have metastatic spread to distant sites. And um, for that, we use imaging studies, CAT scans, bone scans, like MRIs, like that. Um, and then the staging, um, we have a system of staging the cancer. Uh, a, B, C, D, that's one system. Where A is early stage, we call that, and goes down to D, which is late cancer spread. Uh, we, we have a more accurate way of 
of, of, of staging this. And this is this is a very the most the scientific community, the medical community, uses this system more than the ABCD system. We call it the TMM. And, and it tells you the size of the prostate, where the lymph nodes are involved, and where the distant metastatic sites are involved. And they give numbers to each of them, and you can get an overall prognosis of you know what, what the life expectancy is and whether or not you should do anything about the cancer. Next. So this is the ABCD system. Stage A, early cancer. See just a little dot right there. You can't even feel that on the digital rectal exam. But you'll see it uh, on the PSA will show something. They do a biopsy, you know you have cancer. And as you go down, you have more, more disease. You know, C, a lot of disease. D, with a spread. The distant size. And if, you know, like I said, the TNM uh, system takes into consideration the size of the tumor, whether or not the lymph nodes are involved, and whether or not distant sites are involved. Bones, brain, lungs, where it's spread and where it's lymph nodes. Yeah. And this is a, an example of the TNM system, similar to the ABCD system, but it's a little more accurate, it's more detailed. Um, and, well, you don't have to worry, but, you know, these lymph nodes are involved, so it, in this patient, lymph nodes are involved, pelvic lymph nodes. So it's not N0. N0 would mean no lymph nodes. N2 means at least two lymph nodes are involved. And you usually see these nodes on the CAT scan, or if you do biopsy of the nodes. And then M, uh, M0 means no bone is involved, a negative bone scan. M1 means you have, means you have one bony side, so this is a spine. And this is just an example that we have M1 disease for the spine. If you have spine, uh, lung bones, uh, uh, rib cage, then it might be M3. Right? That's three different bones. Yeah? That's all it's done. Next, please. And these are the possible treatment options depending on the stage. Early stage, you could do watchful waiting. The patient is comfortable with that, and if it's an older gentleman. If it's a younger patient, and the patient says, look, I'm four to five, I have another 50 years to develop uh, complication from prostate cancer, I'm going to get treated. You know, and some men will do that. Um, and you could treat by giving radiation, you could, uh, external radiation where you go in a machine like a CAT scan machine and the radiation is shunned onto the pelvis. Or you can have seed implants, we call that brachytherapy. Um, we could have surgery and because this is localized. It's localized to the prostate, so you can cure it at this stage. B, if you are T2 disease, still curable. Um, you could do surgery, radical surgery, you could do radiation therapy. Uh, stage C, it, it get, you could still cure it, but it gets a little more difficult because you have more bulky disease that might not respond very well to radiation. And surgery might leave tissue behind because it's a more radical operation. The, the surgery, the, the, the cancer is so extensive locally that to remove all of it, you might have to take off a piece of the bladder, the sphincter uh, that holds urine when be gone, so the patient is going to leak. So you might say, look, let's treat the prostate where it is with radiation instead of trying to do an extensive operation. Uh, uh, that's, that can be mutilated. Prostate cancer surgery can have a lot of side effects, uh, uncomfortable side effects, leaking you have to wear a diaper, uh, erectile dysfunction. These are these are possible side effects of prostate cancer. And of course, um, if you have stage D disease, which is very extensive, you can't cure that anymore. You just treat the patient to make the patient comfortable. Uh, you have obstruction of the urinary channel. You could go in and do a scraping of the prostate, that part that obstructs so the patient can urinate. Uh, and of course, you can give hormone therapy. Remember, prostate cancer is fueled by testosterone. And um, if a patient has prostate cancer spread into the bones and significant crippling bone pain, if you remove the testicles, that bone pain goes away like two days time, the patient is pain free. 
You know, the patient may have lost weight because of cancer, what you call cachexia. You, you remove the testicle, and, you know, in a few weeks the patient puts on weight and looks, <laughs> looks normal. Um, but that's not a permanent cure. After a while, the, 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 the prostate cancer cells will find a way to get around this lack of testosterone and start growing again. But some patients, you can get up to five, seven years just by doing hormone um, treatment. And we can remove the testicles or you can give what we call LHRH. Um, you don't have to worry about the technicalities of it, but what it does, it prevents the prostate, the, 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 the testicles from making testosterone. Uh, and so you can you get good relief um, um, from that. Uh, years ago, that's all we had to treat extensive prostate cancer, removal of the testicles, but now with this medication, you know, you can get a shot in a month, a shot in three months, and that takes care of that. For patients who live in the Caribbean, the, the, the LHRH medication is very expensive. It's about $700 a month for the shot. And it is no better than removing the testicles. So a lot of men who on fixed income live in Jamaica, they may have retired, they're on social security, they get the social security pen, they live in the Caribbean. You know, they say, take out the testicle, don't worry about it. You don't have to get a shot every month, you don't have to, you know. A lot of insurance companies don't want to pay for the medication. Uh, three month shot is almost um, $2,000, you know, the, you know, it's expensive. Next, please. Now, surgery for prostate cancer. is different than surgery for an enlarged prostate. Let me just say that. Prostate cancer surgery, you're removing the entire prostate. The nerves that cause erections run alongside the outside of the prostate. So that those can get damaged. The sphincter can get damaged. The surgery for prostate enlargement, you're just pouring out that part of the prostate that is obstructing the urine. Right? So a lot of patients who have enlarged prostate, you tell them you need an, an operation to so you, so you're you're better able to urinate, and they get anxious because they think boy they're not going to get an erection problem with confidence. But it's a different operation than surgery for prostate cancer, and um, there are different approaches uh, to the operation for prostate cancer. You can get an operate, you can get an, an incision right in the abdomen here and you go behind the pubic bone, call that a retropubic prostatectomy. This can be done with a knife, or you can make a few keyholes and you do it laparoscopically with the assistance of a robot. But it's the same operation without an incision. And the, the, the potential side effects are the same. You know, uh, you can cut below the scrotum, in the perineum, Perineal prostatectomy. Uh, next. And, and uh, this is how they do the laparoscopic prostatectomy with or without robotic assistance. You know, four poles and the dissect of the prostate using instruments on a stick instead of cutting and, and, and doing it with your hands. Next. And this is what you remove when you do a radical prostatectomy. This is, this is a bladder. This is a prostate. You remove everything that's green, prostate, seminal vessels, and you try to leave the sphincter behind, you try to leave these nerves behind. These are the nerves that cause erections. But you have to detach these nerves from the prostate, and it's hard to see them. So that is why you get erection problems after prostate uh, surgery. And it doesn't matter how you do it. Whether you do it by robot or you do it by perineal approach or retropubic approach, you still have to get these nerves on you. So it's a marketing ploy sometimes to tell you you do robotics so you're not going to have erection. You can still have confidence. Either approach still helps. Next. After you remove everything that was in green, you have to put things together. So you see you have to attach the sphincter back to the bladder and so you have a continuous urinary flow. If the sphincter is damaged, you could have incontinence. If the nerves are gone, you could have erection problems. You try to spear the nerves because they have an idea of where they are. So you try to spear the nerves without leaving cancer cells behind. 
If you try to spare the nerves, and the nerves are stuck to the prostate uh, because cancer is in the area of the nerves, then you have no choice. You just have to cut the nerves and then treat the, the erection problems uh, by other means later. You know, implant, medications, etc. Next, please. Um, so that was surgery. Radiation. Two forms. You can put seeds in, which are permanent little rice grains that give off radiation for a while, kills the prostate cancer without removing the prostate. Right. So, same approach like doing the biopsy, but a little more extensive. You need anesthesia, probe in the rectum, you have some needles that go in the prostate, and then you pass the seeds into the prostate. Uh, the seeds stay there and they give off radiation for a few months, kill the prostate cancer. <coughs> and um, the different, different elements to use that, like iron, like gold, you know, different things, different um, ele uh, elements that, uh, that, that can be used to give off this radiation. Next, please. And this is the external radiation. You want a big machine, it's similar to a CAT scan machine. And um, these things. Uh, produce radiation that is focused on the prostate and kills the prostate right where it is. So, and they work, you know. Uh, prostate cancer is curable and it's definitely uh, the choice you make depends on your philosophy. The incidence of erection problems and incontinence is much lower with radiation than with surgery. For obvious reasons. You're taking, you're cutting things off. The radiation, you're not cutting anything off. You can get erection problems from radiation, but it's a slow, gradual process as the radiation starts affecting the nerves that cause erections. So it's a matter of philosophy. Uh, incontinence, you usually don't get from radiation because you're not removing the sphincter. The, 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 the big difference is that what if every cancer cell of the prostate isn't killed by the radiation? Because the prostate is still there. With surgery, remove the prostate. Then those cells can start growing again. That is why we have to follow the PSA over time. And if it comes back and the PSA starts going up, then you can treat the patient with, uh, you can do surgery after radiation. It's a more radical surgery, it's more difficult because the tissues are all radiated and everything is matted together. And the, the, the normal planes are hard to, to define. Or you can just give hormonal treatment. You know, it depends on the age of the patient. Or you can just watch it sometimes. You know. uh, next. And this, this is freezing of the prostate. Um, similar approach to, to the seeds. But instead of passing seeds through the needles, these needles are connected to a, uh, a freezing mechanism. And these are passed into the prostate on the ultrasound guidance. And the prostate, and these needles produce ice balls that frees the prostate and kills the prostate cancer. And we like to do that as a salvage procedure. A patient uh, may have had radiation that failed. Uh, we can use this method. Um, this one is almost certain to cause erectile problems because the nerves get frozen. In order to do a complete freeze of the prostate, you have to go outside of the prostate. The, 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 the ice ball has to extend outside of the prostate. Uh, and, and cool the rectum. We will warm the rectum. Then you have warm, safe, and flowing in the rectum to prevent the rectum from getting frozen. Uh, but the nerves, you can't do anything about um, heating, up, heating up the nerves to prevent the nerves from getting frozen. Next, please. Uh, this is just a hormone, hormone treatment. Uh, it's first line in patients with very advanced cancer, older patients, patients who fail radiation, and of course these are the different drugs that we use. All right. Thanks. Uh, any questions?
I went to the doctor, he was just, uh, long story short, with the PR, no problem. With the PSA, no, with the PR, no problem. And I have done this like twice. Yeah. And I'm not sure what is triggering that. You could have an enlarged prostate. You could have just have a benign enlarged prostate. You know? um, You don't have to have a big prostate to have urinary problems. Even a small prostate can cause urinary problems. But it's, most, it's more likely that a bigger one would, would, would cause obstruction. When you can have a, just a slightly or normal sized prostate, that can cause obstruction. And, you know, if the DRE is normal, PSA is normal, you could just treat it as benign prostate enlargement. Because the one that the doctor put me on, the last time she put me on the uh, medication, Pluma. Yeah. It's just a case, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you know, because you know, benign prostate disease is funny. You have, we used to just call it BPH for everything, but now we started trying to separate it out. Where we say BPH means you have benign prostate hypertrophy, and that's a that's a, a, a microscopic diagnosis where you would have had, say, a biopsy of the prostate that didn't show prostate cancer, but it showed enlarged glands microscopic glass. It's called a BPH. You can have BPH without any obstructive problems. So now we separate them out that we have BPH, uh, BPE, which is benign prostate enlargement, which you can feel as an enlarged gland, and BPO is obstruction due to, um, to prostate um, uh, enlargement, or, or just due to prostate. So what you had was probably, you definitely had BPO, you had some obstructive disease, but if we don't, you had a biopsy then, if the biopsy was benign, then you would have BPH with BPO. Uh, and if prostate was enlarged on, 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 on the exam, you would have a BPH, BP, and BPO. So. Well, let me share this with you. Um, during the day, I'm fine, no problem. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I'm like, I'm like, yeah. Boom, boom. Yeah, there's a reason. What happened after a while, sometimes I try to sleep in the chair, no problem. Yeah. As soon as I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> yes. So, you know, <laughs> yes. I, I kind of work a little bit. Do you have, do you have high blood pressure? They said so. Yeah, you see what happens, you know? What happens is that? I don't believe that, but they said so. I mean, you need to go down here. I'm going to laugh Well, listen, listen. What happens? I'll tell you what happens, right? <laughs> Wait, in the daytime when you're up and about, right? Now, the blood is pooling down in your leg. Especially if you have some high blood pressure, a little heart, congestive heart problem. When you go to sleep, you're flat. All that blood that's pooling in your leg is now going back to the heart. And the heart is pumping more blood. So the kidneys are seeing more blood. And the urine is just <coughs> filtering blood. So the kidney is filtering more. So you're making more urine. So you pee more, and then on top of that, if you can't empty completely, each time you pee, you have something left in the blood, and then it fills faster, and then you have to go more often at night. In the daytime, it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, well, that's all right. <laughs> No, no, but uh, an acutely infected prostate can cause an obstruction. Sometimes, um, especially if you have an acute infection, a fever, you know, real acute prostatitis, you have to put a tube in the patient, uh, a suprapubic tube directly into the bladder from above. You don't want to put a tube in through the penis because then it blocks the ducts of the prostate that prevents proper drainage and clearing of the infection. So normally you put a, uh, you know, a super tube. But, um, no, but, uh, no, not really, no. So what, did, what are some of the causes of prostatitis and treatment? Yeah, the treatment is usually antibiotic. We don't know what causes chronic um, 
prostatitis. What you, acute prostatitis is almost like a, like a sexually transmitted disease, you know? Um, chronic prostatitis, we think that infections, bacteria from the urinary tube can end up going back down into the prostatic ducts because the prostate has a lot of ducts that open up into the, uh, into the, the urethra. And we think that bacteria from the urethra can go back down into the prostatic ducts and over time can stay there proliferate and cause uh, a chronic infection. It's very hard to treat. Um, the, 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 the antibiotic we used to depend on a lot. It's the same one we use for, for prostate biopsies. And no, it's not that good. We have to treat it for 30 days, sometimes 60 days. Yeah. Yeah. Because the prostate is still there. So, you know, we, don't, we want to know if a few cells uh, would have escaped the radiation and now starting to go back and cause a problem. So you have to get, you have to get tested now. Uh, and of course, if the PSA starts to rise, you, you end up getting a CAT scan, you end up getting a bone scan to make sure that there is nothing in the bone. And, you know, so you're right, the, the, the follow-up is a little more intense after radiation than after surgery. But the side effects are usually less, the immediate side effects are usually less. So if you went to the hospital, you can't care of it, is there? But when your urologist says to you, you are care, why are you going back every six months or every year? Oh, if you're okay? Yeah, yeah well, you're okay now, but six months from now, you might not be okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're okay today. <laughs> Yes. Doctor, I'm 70 years old. I've never had a test for uh, uh, prostate cancer. And based on what you said, black men would have to live with this thing. If I went tomorrow and they told me that I have this thing, what is the best way to go at 70? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 70 without any other problem. No disease, nothing, yeah, no heart problems, something else. No heart problems. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you have prostate cancer. It depends on how much, how aggressive the cancer. You have stage, you have, say, you have Gleason's 4, Gleason's 6. You know, you're 70 years old. You might not want to do anything. It's not bad, you can just say, I'll watch it. Uh, it depends on how comfortable. Some, uh, some patients, they, 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 they hear the word cancer. Prostate cancer grows slowly. If you don't do anything and they have a grade 6 prostate cancer, it's not going to affect you for the next seven years anyway. You, you might say, look, 77 is good enough for me. And when you get to 77, of course, when you get to 77 that it starts causing a problem, you could still do so, you can get hormones. So it depends on your philosophy. You know, some patients say, leave me alone. I'm fine. Well, I thought they said that, leave me alone. I'm not going to like, stick my teeth. <laughs> That's your problem. Yeah. What What do you find has been the most popular method of treatment and how effective has it been? Like the CD and the radiation and the surgery. How do they? How do they impact and what is the sort of the effective period? Yeah, no, that's a good question. We know for the first 10 years they're about equivalent. Surgeon radiation. If you don't have recurrence from radiation, it's usually after 10 years. So for the first 10 years, everybody does equally well. Most of the recurrences we see in radiation is after 10 years. That is why you got to keep following the radiation. In terms of quality of life, the immediate side effects from radiation are much less than the immediate side effects from surgery in terms of incontinence, impotence, and sexual, dis sexual dysfunction. So, you know, you're 70 years old, you might say, look, if I get radiation, I'm good to 80. Then if it comes back and I do nothing, I'm good for another seven years, or I can do another, I can go out on a treat and I'm good for 10 years. That takes me to 85, 90. You know, I do radiation. But if you're 45, then 
recover inside 55 might not be something you want to accept. How about the Hmm? And the and seeding? Seeding plant. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like a one of the how the thing. So the seed is what is the radiation. It's yeah, it's the same thing. thing. Yeah, you can get both. Oh, you know, like Julian had both because he had the seed will will take care of the prostate that's within the inside the prostate. But prostate cancer can be and the board is outside. You might need external radiation to take care of. Julian had that. He had both, you know? Yeah. I want to ask uh, a jump to that, my question. I have uh, about done, I've only done PSA in the past. My dad died like 87 from prostate cancer. My brother was 55, had a very, very good diagnosis with prostate cancer and surgery. And I, I've only had PSA. Uh, in the past, um, do you recommend that I should request of my PCC uh, rectally? Yeah, yeah, it should be. It should. You should have to request it. I mean, it should be automatic. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm 63. I can, I'm yeah, no, no, it should. I think that's a problem. A lot of a lot of doctors no don't want to do PSAs, and you know, no one will rectally do rectal exams because sometimes I have medical students and the. the you know, some of them never did a uh, uh, digital weapons out. And a lot of, as you get older, your, your fingers become more educated. A urologist does, what, 20,000 digital rectal exams in 10 years? I mean, so he's, he can feel a little thing that a guy does five a year is out. So he might be a little bit better at, at, at fine-tuning the, um, the exam. The question that I have, um, because there is the high incidence in Jamaica and in Norwich, and, and my grandfather died in Brazil, and my cousin, what is the correlation between the two areas of why there's such a high incidence? We don't know. That's a problem, you know? We really, really don't. They would say, no, it's our kid, but they don't eat that in America. We were saying it's too much sunshine and people exposed to a lot of sun. But then Norwegians are not, they're not it's a Nordic country. Yeah? Well, then the second part of that is with that, do all, are all doctors aware of this, that so that they ask in terms of families yeah. where your family is from? Yeah, the world's been out for the last 18 years. You know? It's been, yeah. So they, they it's still something, they know. Do you recommend natural treatment for certain diagnosis? Yeah, that's a good question. There are none of Yes. For example, enlarged prostate. Some palmetto works. In fact, in Europe, that's how they treat it. You go to the doctor, it gives you some palmetto. Here, the vitamin the health research works. And there are other things. We think that pomegranate juice, has been proved to have some effects on prostate. Um, tomatoes, the lack of these tomatoes. You know, so, but what we do know is that a fatty diet, a fatty diet, sort of increases your risk for prostate cancer. So a low fat diet, you know, definitely helps. You know, exercise, you know, uh, having too much weight is a risk factor for any kind of cancer, including prostate cancer. Yeah. Study these things, and you know, it's a big, it's a big, big thing. And we said, um, you have doc, you have urologists who just specialize in alternate medicine at NYU. You know, you have people do that. But you know, I wasn't trained in that area, so I usually refer them to to someone who is better at it. Uh, so, one more question. Um, I have a question. My husband passed away from prostate cancer. 
Oh, so and when he um, was Yeah, no, the, the PET scan, as far as prostate cancer is concerned, in today's world, the PET scan should be considered as experimental. There is no, um, it, it hasn't been fully worked out what the findings on a PET scan are that would indicate definitively whether the PET, that's cancer. I see a spot that's cancer. That's not, and I don't see a spot, so there is no cancer. PET scan is basically, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's still, Experimental, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And he, uh, actually, when he passed, it was not there. He said that he passed the size for the bone. Yeah. Around the bowel there. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to find out how old after that. Yeah. Usually, on bone scan, you could see those, those uh, on just a regular bone scan, you know. Not a, you know, not a 5,000 on a PET scan, but that's a regular 200 on a bone scan, nuclear bone scan. It's very, very accurate, the bone so scan. So, I would say for this question, so it wasn't very well for the men here, because they were doing mostly the PET scan, yeah, not no. bone scan. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 sometimes, sometimes, you know, unless he's in like a protocol, like a study, that they're saying they're trying to compare bone scan to PET scan, you know, Usually a bone scan is, is good enough. Yeah. Now if you don't see anything on a bone scan and the PSA is uh, funny and you think the patient has bone pain and you think there might be something that you're missing, then you might need a PET scan. Actually, you're always looking for answers, no? Actually, because the long time started the treatment, the same is the PSA was going down. Yes. Usually it goes down. Yeah. yeah. Even if you met metastatic disease, you get the PSA goes down once you start to remove that hormone. Once you remove that testosterone, it goes down right away. Um, even if it's a thousand, it goes down. Sometimes it goes down to normal. But then, because it was starting so high, it means you have very aggressive disease that is going to get around the hormone. If you start treating with hormones and the PSA was seven, it goes down to undetectable levels in, in a matter of weeks, a month. Um, and it probably will stay down because we're starting from 7. Now if you start from 1500, it might go down to 10. But because it's starting so high, you have very aggressive disease that is more, more likely to get around that hormone treatment and come back in a, in a very... Of course, there's chemotherapy too, but chemotherapy for prostate cancer is not that good. But when you fail hormone and that kind of, sometimes you get chemotherapy. Actually, you know, that's what I'm yeah, but it's not very, it's, uh, because prostate cancer, you see for chemotherapy to work, the cells have to absorb the, the chemotherapy and then that kills the cells. Cells absorb stuff better if they're rapidly growing. So prostate cancer, kidney cancer, these are slow growing tumors. So, 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 so the chemotherapy drugs don't get into these tumors and work very effectively. That's the only thing. All right, thank you very, very much for inviting me. After listening to Dr. Thompson this morning, or this afternoon, I feel like a doctor. <laughs> I think we, get from, we got from him A to Z. And I want to tell him how much we um, accept his deliverance this morning. We do appreciate you being here.